Good evening. Welcome to the meeting of the Health and Adult Social Care Scrutiny Committee, which is being held at the Civic Offices. I'm Councillor Mariah Priestley, Chair of the Committee. Members of the Committee are present, <clears throat> and I will ask them to introduce themselves shortly. Some officers and witnesses are present as well. Others will be joining the meeting online. Now that virtually all COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted and members of the public can attend in person, scrutiny committee meetings are no longer being live streamed. However, meetings will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel as soon as practicable after the meeting. For those present, please be aware that we are not expecting a fire alarm this evening. And in the event that the alarm sounds, please exit the building by the nearest marked exit. Assemble outside as indicated by the committee manager. So on to item number one, apologies and introductions. Ross, have you received any apologies, please? Uh, Chair, we have apologies from Nana Ogantola and uh, Tracy Keach, who's substituted from Maxine Taffetini. Do we have apologies from Councillor Walker for lateness or for... Yes, no. Right. <laughs> Do we know how long he's going to be late? Uh, no, no, he's, on his way. he's on his way, as per normal. Okay, thank you. I will now ask each member of the committee to introduce themselves. Uh, can I start from my left hand, please? Hello, uh, Vicky Head, Director of Public Health. And Marimba Carr, Deputy Director of Public Health. Could you please repeat your introduction, again. Vicky? Is that better? Vicky Head, Director of Public Health. And Marimba Carr, Deputy Director for Public Health. Thank you. I'll come nice and close to the microphone for you, Nigel. Alice Jenkins, Councillor, Member of this Committee. Thank you. Okay. Yes. yes. Welcome. Uh, Councillor Liam Andrews, member of this committee. Councillor Anne Cry Whitehead, member of this committee. Sorry. Councillor Joe Hernshaw, uh, vice chair of this committee. Ros Tidman, committee services manager. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Marie Bradburn. and I represent Bradwell Ward, and I'm vice vice chair of this committee. Good evening. I'm, I, I'm Nigel Long. I'm a councillor for Bletchley Park. Thank you. Maxine Taffetani. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Healthwatch Milton Keynes, representing Healthwatch Milton Keynes. I'm Jane Well. I'm a palliative medicine consultant and have been invited to join this meeting. Is it... Is it just Dr. Diane or is uh, it no, Diane? Diane Medic. Diane Medic, okay, for the uh, end of life. Yeah, and Peter, Peter Wilkins. Peter Wilkinson. Okay, all right. Well, you're welcome, Diane and Peter. Okay, on to um, <clears throat> agenda item number two disclosure of interests. Councillors uh, to declare any disclosable pecuniary interests or personal interests, including other pecuniary interests they may have in the business to be transacted and officers to disclose any interest they may have in any contract to be considered. Are there any interests to be declared? Yes, Councillor Whitehead. Yeah, um, I just want it to be known that um, my father passed away at Will and Hospice and also other members of my family. So if anything to do with Will and never comes, I'd like it sort of put on record. Thank you. That's noted, Councillor, thank you. Any other interests? Okay. All right. So on to item number three, which are the minutes. We have the minutes of the meeting held on the 10th of March 2022 and the 18th of May 2022 in the agenda pack. Are the minutes agreed? Yeah. Okay. I can see nods around the room. So I will sign them later. Uh, and then on to item number four, which is uh, named five, but it is actually four. 
in the agenda item, which is the COVID-19 update. And I'm assuming, Vicky, are you the main uh, respondent on that? Uh, so Marimba is going to take us through the paper quickly. Thank you. Okay, so tonight to give you a brief update on the COVID situation and also a uh, update on the monkeypox situation. So while the levels of COVID infection in the uh, they're much lower currently than they were at the peak at the end of March, the levels of infection are relatively still relatively high, um, and we have seen a small increase in the number of cases in the last couple of weeks. And um, although we saw a fall in the number of, of cases in, in the two months previously, we are now seeing uh, an increase. And currently, there are about it's estimated about 150 people are infected, which is an increase from about a couple of weeks ago from one in 70. So we are seeing an increase. In England, the percentage of people infected as of the 11th of June, week ending 11th of June, it's estimated about 2% of the population um, are infected, and that compares to about 7.6% of the population at the end of March and 1.4% at the end of May. The prevalence in Milton Keynes is roughly similar to the national picture, was about 2%, 2.1% uh, of the population are uh, infected. There are two new Omicron variants um, emerging, and that's the BA4 and the BA5, and it's thought that it's the increase in those variants that are partly responsible for the, the increase in cases, um, and currently they represent just over half of all uh, cases um, in, in, in the population. As of the 13th of June, uh, if we're thinking about, if we look at Milton Keynes Hospital, uh, there are 24 patients with COVID in hospital, um, with, and no patients in critical care, critical care unit, uh, and that's a small decrease from, from previous uh, weeks. In care homes, also as of the 13th of June, there were four care homes uh, with a current COVID outbreak, and there were four, um, four residents and seven members of staff who, who are infected, and while the number of outbreaks in care homes is currently low, Again, we've seen a small increase in the last couple of weeks. Um, with regards to the new, the new strains I've mentioned, the BA4 and BA5, there's currently no evidence that there's uh, increased, of, uh, increased risk of uh, more severe infection, um, but we'll keep monitoring the data that's available um, nationally and internationally as well. But what we also need to uh, continue to monitor the situation because as we get more cases, there may be more hospitalizations um, and patients in intensive care um, and also uh, sadly deaths so we'll, we'll keep monitoring the situation as you mentioned chair the there's currently limited testing um, and no no requirement to isolate currently um, and so uh, vaccination remains one of the most or the most important thing that we can do to protect ourselves and the population and so it's really important that everybody gets vaccinations that they're eligible for, the boosters, the spring boosters, um, in uh, all, all the, the age groups and the uh, those at risk who are eligible, it's really important that we push the vaccinations um, and encourage them, those who are eligible, to take them up. And that includes children as well. So children um, from the age of five can, can receive the vaccine and it's really important that we promote the vaccine in those groups as well. So we'll continue to work with our partners to encourage and promote the vaccination, um, and particularly amongst those who are at risk of severe infection. I'll move on to mon monkeypox next. So um, there's been an update in the number of cases from the, the figures um, that, are, that you received in the report. The figures as of Monday, so that's the 20th of June, there have now been 793 cases confer confirmed in the UK, uh, and 766 of those uh, are in England. As um, you may be aware, monkeypox is a viral infection, and in the UK, cases are usually associated with travel to West or Central Africa. Um, confirmed cases, though, are being seen globally um, and are related. Uh, cases are being seen in people who haven't travelled to, to Africa, um, and it's the first time that there are cases without an, uh, an epidemiological link to, to travel. Monkeypox is uh, generally quite a mild illness and uh, it's self-limiting, so people don't need, gen always need to seek health care um, and generally get better um, uh, over time. And it's spread by very close contact with someone who's infected. 
Um, so unlike COVID, which is a respiratory illness, um, you need very close contact um, in order to, to um, get the infection. And the risk in the UK is thought to be very low. It's really important to stress that anybody can catch monkeypox, although the cases that we, in this particular um, situation, the cases have predominantly been amongst uh, bisexual, gay and other men who have sex with men. And so we are encouraging um, individuals who, who do display symptoms to, um, to contact their sexual health clinic or call the NHS 111. There is a vaccine for monkeypox, um, which is being um, offered to individuals who are, who are eligible, who have been um, exposed, and that will um, reduce the risk of symptomatic infection and also severe illness. The UK Health Security Agency is leading the national response, um, and Vicky receives regular updates um, on, on the national uh, picture, um, and we are um, remaining in contact with them. They, the UK Health Security Agency are responsible for contact tracing and also for the general comms to the population, um, so that's not something we've needed to lead on at, at this point. Uh, we're also working very closely with our sexual health services um, to make sure that our residents are able to access testing um, and also vaccination in due course. So, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Marimba. Uh, can I open the floor for comments and questions, please? Yes, Councillor Jenkins. Thanks. Ooh, I'll move it forward, forward just for Nigel. Um, I wondered if you might be able to give us an update on the accessibility of vaccines, um, because I understand in particular for the under uh, the over fives, the five to 12 year olds, there's none available in Milton Keynes at all. Um, and I wondered how long that's been going on for and what's being done in order to rectify it. <coughs> So that is not something that I have been, that has been brought to my attention. So I will absolutely look at that and I'll let you know. Cool, thanks. Thank a couple you. of weeks is the answer. A couple of weeks. <laughs> at least, yeah. And is that, as in, is that an inability to make an appointment or is that understood to be a... Apparently there's no vaccines in Milton Keynes for the 5 to 12 year olds and there hasn't been for some time. And so if you want an appointment, you have to go outside of the borough, which of course is limiting because if you've got to fit it in around schools and everything, it's nigh on impossible. And I think in particular, my view would be is you have a golden opportunity as you get to the summer holidays when parents are off with children anyway to do a big push around no, five to 12 yeah, year olds to then, to then get them in. And if there's no vaccines locally, it's, yeah, it's inhibiting, isn't it? Thank you. I will absolutely follow up on that. Um, and just on your point there about there being an opportunity at the moment to promote vaccines, I completely agree. I think we think that the both the end of term and the holidays is a good moment, but then also the return in September um, is another good moment to that message about being ready for the autumn and being ready for the new term. I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any follow up questions, Alice? <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, uh, any more questions? Uh, Councillor Bradburn, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was just wondering about the vaccinations um, going forward, um, about the, the spring booster and the over 75s and the vulnerable with medical conditions. Um, when, is, when is it going to be introduced for the other bits of the population, say the younger ones of less than 75 or, you know, because I haven't heard anything. It's like as if, if we didn't have COVID at all, it's like as if it's all gone away. Um, and the, again, in taking on what Alice said, you know, come September, um, there'll be flu injections, there'll be all sorts. And, I, you know, it would be nice for us to know what we can tell residents, because definitely I know that my residents over 75 have had their vaccines. I just wondered, going forward, what are the recommendations for the, for the younger people? Um, so at the moment, there has been no, there's been no final decision on what vaccines will be offered to the population in the autumn. We know that the, JF the JCVI, so the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, is saying that at the moment their recommendation is likely to be, again, for that same group, so the older people and those with underlying health conditions. But I don't think there's been a specific list published there. But they will be looking very closely at um, 
uh, people's immunity levels. So through the random sampling that's done to look at COVID infections, they also look at how many antibodies people have. So they will be looking to see whether, um, particularly with younger people, we expect them to maintain a better duration of response to the vaccine. So it may be that there simply isn't a need in younger groups for another vaccine yet. So they'll be looking closely at that. They'll also be looking at what's happening with new variants um, and infection levels. Um, and we'll be keeping an eye on what their um, decision is. And then, of course, that will be communicated to the NHS who will need to roll out the delivery of that. But the short answer is there's no final decision yet on what will be available and offered to people in the autumn. Just to come back on that, perhaps with the uh, rising cases now, maybe that's something that's going to be a priority perhaps going forward because uh, we are seeing an increase. So, uh, and we're heading, we'll be heading soon, September, October. So uh, it, is, it is a bit worrying. So thank you. Any comeback, Vicky? Um, I mean, I, I share, I absolutely share your concern. Um, it does feel like a worrying time. As, and as I say, I think it, we know that there are agencies who will be keeping the situation under review um, and looking at whether it, they feel there is a need for another vaccine in the autumn um, and who, who would benefit from another vaccine in the autumn. So we'll be just looking closely at what their decision is. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I have a question, but I just wanted to see if there's any other questions around the room before I ask mine. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Vicky around uh, vaccination uptakes, and I'm rather asking this from a selfish point of view in terms of my ward, because I know that CMK, just before the second quarter turn, was seen as having one of the lowest uptakes um, of the vaccination. So I wondered whether you had any intel on how that's progressed in conjunction or in comparison to the rest of the city. Um, so I don't, I haven't looked at the ward level data in the last few weeks, so I can't give you a direct answer for that, but I can get that data to you. Um, so um, we have been continuing our work on vaccination engagement. Um, we have some vaccination engagement officers who work in Milton Keynes, um, and we are continuing the work we're doing to make contact with people that we know are unvaccinated. So we are uh, making phone calls to unvaccinated individuals, and that work continues. Um, so we are, so I, think, I mean, as Marimba said earlier, you know, the vaccine is the most important thing people can do to protect themselves, um, which is why we've really prioritised that work to, to, to make contact with individuals. Um, the central Milton Keynes problem is a is an interesting one. I think there like to be a number of factors that under underpin that, and we are grateful for your you know your support on that. Um, but I think anything that ward members are able to do to continue to get messages out to their communities is very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for that, Vicky. And yes, I will be interested in getting some um, intel uh, at ward, le ward level regarding not just CMK but right across the board. Please, thank you. Okay, Councillor Jenkins. Thanks. Um, so one very simple question, Midsummer Place, moving it from Saxon Court, um, particularly if we end up in the winter having a revival of the um, vaccine programme, free parking, very simple because it will put people off going. Is there going to be provision for free parking around there? So that's a question that would need to go to our NHS colleagues who are working on that. I think it's definitely worth asking as public health because it will affect numbers because people won't want to pay in order to go and to go and get their vaccines and it needs to be made as simple as possible. It will affect it generally it will affect vaccination rates, which is ridiculous, but it, it will. Um, so it may be one for the cabinet member, Moran, um, to ensure that that happens. Can ask the questions. Thank Sorry. you. Um, and then secondly, um, I'm I'm an optimist naturally, but. Um, <coughs> I think spending the last three years talking to you over Zoom, Vicky, from, from our respective offices, I've perhaps um, got worn down. Um, care home numbers are up. There aren't the provisions that there were previously. We've got winter coming. September is usually the peak because the children go back to school. The weather starts getting colder. I can... I'm not an advocate of lockdown again, far from it. But um, I guess, are we as a council ready? Um, if we have to step things up again, 
are we ready to get going? And is it as simple as pressing a button? And what measures have you taken in order to ensure that we're ready? Um, so I can speak I can speak from a public health perspective um, and what we are doing. So um, we have maintained a small, flexible COVID resource. Um, so we have people who are currently doing lots of making lots of vaccination calls, but who would be in a position to um, move back to doing contact tracing should that be required again, um, and making sure that their you know their training is kind of up to date on that as we go forwards. Um, and so the, and the, the real purpose in keeping those people on is, is absolutely, as you suggest, we, we don't know how the next six, nine, 12 months are going to pan out. Um, and while we can be optimistic, it does seem uh, sensible to make sure we're in a position to respond. So those people can, can pivot back, as I say, to contact tracing. We have people who can help um, provide support where there are outbreaks um, in uh, schools, for example, or in care homes. Um, so I think we are as well placed as we can be, um, recognising that local actions will always be influenced by approaches taken at a national level. Yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Vicky. And, okay, I can see two more. Councillor Hearnshaw and then Councillor Whitehead, please. So I just wanted to ask, um, are we seeing a decrease in the antibody uh, sort of concentration average amongst the younger population? And are we monitoring this in Milton Keynes? So we, we don't monitor that at a local level. Uh, that would be monitored as part of national surveillance activities. Um, I uh, haven't looked at the data. I'm, I don't think I've seen data published on that recently, um, but that's absolutely what the national bodies, UK Health Security Agency, JCVI, will be looking at in making their decisions about vaccination going forward. <laughs> My uh, question in between coffee, and I apologise, is, um, I mean, I've got quite a lot of concerns. I mean, I'm a ward councillor for Stony Stratford, and I've seen an increase of residents on Fuller Slade, which is one of my patches with um, getting COVID. And obviously, we <laughs> people are struggling for money, and I'm just worrying how they're going to pay for, pay for like these tests. I mean, they're £2 for one test, you know, and people are going to take that risk of... You know, because obviously food's going up, uh, gas, electricity is going to go up as well, of not taking a test and go out and infect people. And, I mean, I, I mean, you know as well, we've got disabled, a lot of disabled and elderly people living on full of slaves, you know, and they're vulnerable, you know, and I'm quite worried about it. Is there any plans for people to sort of have free tests, you know, sort of these lateral flows, or is that completely stopped, or...? So, testing strategy is set at a national level, um, so that's not something that is a local decision for us. I do share your concerns about people being able to afford the tests, uh, particularly, you know, given competing financial pressures, um, and where there were opportunities to feed that into decision making, I did so. Um, it is worth noting that there remain some small groups of people who are able to access free testing. So uh, individuals who are, um, essentially it's the individuals who are se severely immunosuppressed, so who may not have such a good response to vaccination, they are still el eligible for testing. Um, so, it, so, and people, not all residents in that group may quite be aware of that. Um, but I, yeah, as I say, I, I share your concerns about the availability of free testing. Any follow-up, councillor? Thank you so much. Okay, any more questions, comments around the table? Or have we exhausted the update of COVID-19 and monkeypox? I have one more question around monkeypox, actually, and I know that, um, Marimba, when you were giving your, your update on this, you talked about the comms aspect, and I think, if I'm right, remembering you saying that it's more nationally driven than locally, um, but I wanted to understand how we're interacting with that as a local authority, because I know when um, you know COVID-19 was at its peak, there was a lot of conversation at this committee 
around comms and the same thing, the same sort of uh, flow in terms of having a, a national comms was the, the sort of key focus, but there was a lot of work that we did here, pushing and working with people like Vicky and the comms lead here to interact with that. So I'm wondering, with monkeypox, what is the local response? So I was actually talking to our comms team this afternoon about this, um, and because 99% of the cases are amongst um, gay, bisexual, or many of sex with men, um, I think if we start pushing out local um, comms, targeted comms, I think there is a risk that we can uh, increase stigma around um, around the the infection, and um, so it's, we need to be really careful about over. Uh, communicating about it. So what we are doing is supporting the national comms locally. We're also working, as I said, with our sexual health services where um, where the cases may present more, be more likely to present to get information or advice. And so we can provide more targeted messaging working with our sexual health services rather than general comms to, to the community, to the residents. No, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Marimba. Any more questions, comments before we move on from this uh, item? Okay, thanks very much, ladies. Did you want to do a recommendation around the parking cabinet member and parking? Absolutely, and there were two or three other um, recommendations or actually questions that I know I've uh, posed to Vicky around the uh, ward data for um, vaccination take up as well. Thank and you. And Councillor Jenkins' point around uh, vaccination availability for five, twelve years. We've just we've talked about parking. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next item, which is uh, palliative and end of life care for adults in Milton Keynes, and I think. I think we have uh, Diane Medic online. I think you were there just before we kicked off the, uh, the meeting. And we've got Dr. Jane here this evening. And we've got Peter, I think, online as well. Great. Good evening, ladies. Good to see you. Um, who's presenting this evening? Diane. Diane. OK. Diane, over to you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, you've had the paper. I'm just going to pick out some headlines. Um, so palliative and end of life care is now a national priority. National guidance was published last November um, with um, to, to support the ambitions framework, which is a national strategy. And another document, important document, is a commissioning um, investment framework requiring both health and social care colleagues to work together to ensure that we review palliative and end of life care services. There are some key um, ambitions that we need to meet in the strategy and there are some key priorities in the guidance. The, one of the key priorities is clinical excellence. So we've been tasked as a system to review what we currently uh, provide or commission um, to deliver palliative and end-of-life care for adults and children. We've got two pieces of work aligned to this. And we are working, well, we were working to look to improve the pathway, look at the weaknesses um, and streamline um, an integrated model for your Milton Keynes residents. The uh, guidance was supported by two national service specifications. So it's very clear what um, is expected of us by NHS England and improvement. So that's clinical excellence. The other key priority is NHS digital. And obviously with COVID and the pandemic, why are we not surprised? Um, more use of technology, but more importantly, is the need to have um, individuals, personalised care and support plans in one place, in a, uh, within a cohort of known palliative and end of life care patients that can be shared across our clinicians and professionals and available at point of need, so that if a patient deteriorates, there should be one place that they can view. At the moment, that is not, um, that is not achievable. 
We have made some progress. We've got a community, what I call a community IMT hub unit. We're currently transferring all of the current known patients into that unit, so they're all in one place. And we're also working on the fact that we need health and social care colleagues across the hospice, the hospital, social care, all to see that from an operational perspective. So they're all working together around the individual. The other key priority is workforce and education. So we have, again, a programme of work going on, uh, looking at skills for he health and skills for care, looking at the competencies across health and social care, looking at how we develop an integrated workforce and education programme, looking at how we target um, uh, areas of where we, we know that there may well be a need for support, additional education, additional professional input, um, and that is supported as well by a business intelligence dashboard so that we're developing some intelligence about where our patients are, where they're going, what happens to them, uh, where they, uh, when are they admitted to hospital and how we can work together to develop the skills and competencies to make sure they get cared for in the right place. The other key priority is patient engagement and co-production. So we did start to have some face-to-face -face sessions in November, but that was paused for emergency um, level four, COVID pandemic. Uh, we're restarting that again. And um, we have a face-to-face -face session booked um, in Milton Keynes uh, to discuss that on the 6th of July. We have invited our social care colleagues just for members' information. The other key priority is quality. Within the national guidance, there's some emerging key quality metrics that we will be monitored on. We also have to develop a five-year investment plan. I think that's now four years, to be fair, because we've lost a year with the pandemic. And the guidance suggests, well, not suggests, requires both health and social care to fully fund core and specialist services. The current situation for your residents is we have two main providers and of which representatives have joined me this evening. We've got Willen uh, Hospice and Peter is the chief exec of the hospice and we have Milton Keynes University Hospital and Dr Jane Well has joined you there in person from the hospital. Those are the two main providers. The ask is that we integrate as much as possible the pathway that a person who is identified as palliative and going on a journey through to the end of life is as streamlined, as integrated as possible. We want to also ask um, for your help in listening to your residents. We need to uh, use your networks for any of your constituents that would be happy. We have some networks that we're utilising and we do work closely with Healthwatch. Um, we have a Healthwatch representative for BLMK um, called Jennifer Foley. But that is something that we need to do so that although we've got an emerging model, um, the, the need is that we must make sure it, need, it meets our patients and your um, constituents' needs. We have a different patchwork of services across Bedfordshire, Luton and Milton Keynes. In Bedfordshire and Luton, we already have integrated care hubs, staffed and operational. In Milton Keynes, we don't. So it's a big gap. Having the IMT unit of the data will be a first step, which we're achieving currently. But unless we can make it, operational with appropriately qualified staff to actually receive single referral, do uh, in, uh, multidisciplinary and multi-agency care assessments and planning, make sure that they're, all their assessments needs are met and that they're, all their wishes and needs of their families and carers are in one place. Um, we don't have that in Milton Keynes, so we've got a long way to go in comparison to Bedfordshire and Luton. We're not saying that Bedfordshire and Luton are perfect. We're doing a review on those existing hubs, but we, we don't even have a starting point in Milton Keynes. Uh, to, and we have lim limited to no funding to make that um, requirement happen. 
that's enough for me. I will take questions, but I'd also like to hand over to my colleagues in case they want to add anything. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And I know that Peter and uh, Dr Jane, you're here. So if I could start with Peter, since you're online, any few words from you? Thank you very much, Chair. Much appreciated. Um, I can only um, concur with everything that Diane said. Uh, I think that the, the priority now placed on palliative and end-of-life care is very welcome, but we also need to see development and investment in all of those services and a recognition of them as a really important part of the Milton Keynes health and social care economy. Um, over the last decade, um, funding for hospice palliative care has decreased significantly. Um, in relation to will and hospice, it's gone from 26% from the statutory sector to 18%. And you can imagine over the period of the pandemic how very difficult it's been to fundraise to meet that gap. But we are committed to working in an integrated way with the hospital, as we always have done. Um, and to deliver on the um, objectives of the ambitions documentation. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That's some um, interesting um, uh, statistics you've just given there, and I'd like to probably ask some questions about it uh, in a little while. Uh, over to you, Dr. Jane. button. <laughs> so it, the palliative and end of life care has really had an important role to play throughout the pandemic. People are a lot more aware of the service we provide or try to provide. Um, it's part of the new, the new health and social care bill that's just gone through parliament. It's actually got a place in that now. So it's really risen in people's agendas over the last few years, but the funding hasn't matched it. So we, you know, in Milton Keynes, over 50% of people die in hospital. That's not where they want to be, but we struggle to get people home to die. We struggle to provide the care that's needed. The services just aren't joined up enough. To get people home takes so many different people to do so many different tasks. It's a real challenge. And if you look throughout the country, the, the level of services provided is so different. So it's so much more joined up in London and you know, places in Yorkshire and things. There's a, they've got a palliative care um, hub thing like Diane was talking about in Airedale which is one of the, the big palliative care areas. In an Airedale, 20% of patients die in hospital. Everyone else dies at home or in a hospice. With this service in Airedale, for every um, pound they put into the service, they save two pounds in the whole, whole healthcare economy. So it could be really valuable. And it makes a huge difference to patients when it's the most important time for patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Jane. Um, there's lots to talk about here, lots of questions, and I'm sure that people have read up on the papers and are ready to jump in. Um, what I would probably want to do is to open up to questions and then uh, sort of fuel with, with mine uh, as, as the evening progresses. Uh, I have to say that I am going to give this a little bit of an extended time because our next item... Uh, has been postponed to our next meeting, so we've got a bit more time to um, deliberate on this. So the floor's open. Any questions, comments from the floor? Yes, Councillor Bradburn. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just wondering um, what what the plan is for to implement this new hub, if there is uh, timing on that or what, what, if you could give me a bit more, I'll give us a bit more around that area, please. Thank you. Shall I take this? Oh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Diane. Thank you. As senior commissioner, um, we've put in place um, a really um, strict governance programme of work. So all of the headlines that I've given you is within a programme plan with um, deadline dates for implementation. Um, we're ready to go, or, or more or less, I'll say we're ready to go. As soon as the model has been co-produced and there's agreement, we think we know in order to get the hub operational, the staffing required from an NHS perspective, but we're not 
I'm absolutely sure what we need from the local authority, to be honest, because the programme of work of the face-to-face -face sessions and the redesign meetings were did unfortunately have to be paused for about five months. But I just want to reassure you that there is a very detailed um, programme that sits behind us. Good, need to sort my teeth out. Uh, that sits behind all this work, um, and it goes into minutia and detail of the tasks that we're undertaking in order to, to meet the national guidance. I have to report every month to NHSEI on progress. So that just tells you how much of a priority is. They've established a strategic clinical network um, and uh, we feed straight up to the national lead, Professor Biwi, um, and they are overseeing our timelines. We we have um, an ambitious time frame. We want to move quickly. The only two uh, restricting factors is making sure that the model that is emerging and the pathway suits your residents and constituents' needs, and also that the operational staff are available to then uh, implement the pathway. Okay, any comeback? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. I was, yes, just thank you for that, Diane. I still would like to know if, if the, what the timeline, if we've got some kind of timeline thinking about it and... If, if we had funding available, we um, would very quickly, we've got an emerging service spec, we've got an emerging model that we could co-produce with your residents and constituents. We have the IMT and t all sorted, we have the uh, all so loads of things in place. I think we would be aiming, by the very least, to get in this be before winter, and I know winter seems all year at the moment, especially with COVID and other pressures. But we could um, really escalate this programme and get it in place um, around October, November, in line with the winter plan. Thank you, that's what I was looking for. Thank okay. Thanks, uh, Councillor Bradburn. But just for my own clarity then, so are we saying winter, this winter, 2022? Okay. We are. We are. We're already planning and palliative and end of life care is part now of our EPRR, <clears throat> excuse me, business continuity and winter planning. Um, so we're already embedding what we've got. We just would like to maximise the use of the integration. OK, thank you. Any more questions? Yes, Maxine. Um, it notes consultation and you mentioned co-production with residents consultation and co-production are two quite different things and it's it's not clear to me in the document what the vision you know what what is the role for the resident in designing this service could you be a bit more clear about the the kind of vision and model for involving people in designing the services um, well, we, we've been listening to uh, various uh, patients and their relatives and carers about what's gone wrong. The hospital have um, a, a, a group, and Dr Jane Well will probably like to say more, so does the hospice. So the professionals have um, a reasonable idea of how or when things have not gone to plan. And it really is the integration of all services working together as a multi-agency system. Set, telling the story several times, if they go into hospital, telling it to the hospital staff, if they go into the community, district nurses being oblivious, the doctors not necessarily being up to date with their palliative and end of life care. So having that personalized care and support plan in place, documented in a, in a uh, the community hub, with all health and social care professionals being able to view it. Obviously, at levels of detail it, with consent of the patient and their relatives uh, would mean that um, when things happen unexpectedly, um, people like the ambulance service um, would be able to react and not convey. When they arrive in ED, if they had more information, they might be able to turn them around and turn, send them home. Um, everybody would understand their needs and wishes, uh, where the place of death, the sorts of things, do they want <clears throat> to be resuscitated, all of those things in one place instead at the moment. Um, the risk is that they're in a fragmented um, set of re 
records across primary, community and acute and hospice settings. OK, thanks, uh, Diane. Any follow up? OK, thanks, Maxine. Any more questions, comments around the table? Can I um, throw in a question, Diane, just sort of uh, following up from what uh, Maxine asked there in terms of the co-production uh, question. So I've had a look at the model, um, and forgive me, I'm, through my sort of professional background, I do a lot of programme management. So immediately when I looked at this, I thought, well, what was the as is? What, what was this before it became the model in the paper? Um, obviously, you can't share that with us now because that's far too detailed and we don't have anything to, you know, to make the reference. But what I would like to ask is this model that you've got now, what is the, the difference about it in terms of how has it improved the flow? How has it improved the, the patient journey? I think it's how could it if in place because it's not in place at the moment just for so oh, as oh. is at the moment we have Milton Keynes Hospital uh, we have 27 um, is it 27 in GP surgeries we ha yeah I think it's 27 GP surgeries across Milton Keynes they each have an electronic palliative um, patient care record that's what EPAC stands for so they um, there's 27 little different units embedded in primary care that can't be shared, that isn't shared with any other um, organisation at the moment. We then have, if a patient goes into hospital, we have um, eCare, which is the hospital system that records the patient's admission and their treatment and their journey and their discharge. And that is set in eCare. We have System 1, which um, is in Willen. And what we're doing is EPAX sits within System 1. So the first thing is we're doing is to get one IMT unit in one place to house all of those um, individuals' treatment plans and care plans for those people that have consented. That makes That's the core of the model in the centre of the diagram to have all the information in one place. The sort of blue squares around it is the recognition that there's lots of people that would need to access that information at various different times to provide support in caring, to support um, the family in bereavement after death, to support specialist palliative care nursing advice, which um, women provide in the community. Um, to coordination of care around their individual requirements and any equipment that they need, all being focused in one place. Instead of having to knock on the equipment service door, which is Millbrook, the hospital are do their bit, will and do their bit, and we do have input from district nursing team as well. So I suppose the ask, it, the, what will be different is that all of those services would be centred on that individual, that all be working for the needs of that individual and their families and carers, and basic information that they would require about their needs and wishes would all be in one place, and it's not at the moment. Hence, telling an individual story several times, when I think most of our public think we all know each other's information, and we just don't. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Diane. Sorry, just to add to that. So in other areas, it's shown to reduce hospital emissions because everything's in one place. People don't get sent to hospital unnecessarily for things that aren't going to help. So in um, Cambridge, have just started it. And in six months, they've had over a thousand calls and prevented over 100 emissions, which is huge in terms of cost. That really is interesting. So I guess my follow-up to that then would be um, tying it into Maxine's comments around co-production and your thoughts um, that you've already shared in the paper around how you intend to roll this out and talk to residents. How is it that you're going to um, present this in a way that residents can identify and actually understand what's going on? Um, I mean, the reason I'm able to identify with this is because I have a background in health. I work in it every day. 
Um, and I know that there are people around the table who have the same sort of background. So my question is, how are you intending to translate this into resident speak and what is the plan? I think the first thing is that um, we need to listen and gain uh, the public view and relatives and carers because what we haven't fed into this model is their actual experiences. So in other areas, I'm working with the councils to hold listening events and tapping into our uh, constituent members' um, ability to hold drop-in sessions or whatever networks you have, that we could be invited along to listen um, to quite, I mean, for those that want to, it's a very sensitive area. So it, it's very, very difficult to, I mean, after a person's passed away, perhaps people don't want to come forward, but a few may, because if they think it's going to improve somebody else's journey um, in the palliative and end of life stages. Um, so I think stage one is just not to offer out a solution, is we want to listen and just double check that our professionals that we've been working with have the same view. So before we present anything to our public, I think we need to be seen to be listening. We can then go away from the listening event, and I think there's been enough clinical and professional input to perhaps second guess that some of the things that we've witnessed as professionals are going to be some of the things they tell us about the, you know, not having their information in one place, the being conveyed to hospital when they didn't want to be, dying in hospital when they wanted to die at home or in a hospice. I think those stories will come through. So then the solution would come next. We would then um, co-produce the model and offer it back to say, if this pathway existed, would this meet your needs and we would drop the jog and hence I did put a little glossary because we're very good and you'll know councillor in talking in jargon and when I've done um, listening events before I give all the members of the public a yellow card which they can hold up if they hear anything that I've um, said that is um, NHS jargon speak so I think very much I say a listening event and your help um, but my worry is it's no good actually going to the public and listen if we haven't got a solution that we can fund to, 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 to keep our promises. Because I'm sure, as you will know, um, we often go to consultation, but unless we can actually demonstrate that we've got the resource to actually make a difference, it's going to dis it'd probably be more upsetting for individuals um, so I think securing the um, basis of revenue alongside that would be really helpful. Okay, thanks very much, Diane. That, that actually did answer quite a bit of my, my queries. Um, there is a recommendation that I'd like to put forward, but I think uh, I can see it. Was, was there a hand up? Or... Yeah, Maxine, go ahead. Now, forgive me if I get this wrong, because I was trying to digest a, NHS, a detailed NHS document about um, the com future commissioning arrangements from April 2023, um, when the Integrated Care Board takes on some delegated commissioning. And I believe that includes some delegated responsibilities for specialist palliative care. Um, I think I'm right there. That's okay. But I, I, I assume, I'm hoping that somebody within the CCG at the moment might know a little bit more about what that might hold in the future and whether that in itself might open up opportunities for more investment and control over funding of palliative and end of life care in Milton Keynes as well as across BLMK. Shall I answer that? We. Um, we invest, although not enough, we, we already invest as a CCG in Will and Hospice and the hospital for palliative and, and um, palliative end of life care. Um, the problem is, is that we haven't got any additional money in our integrated care uh, system at the moment. 
the to answer the question about a priority, it is a national priority. It's in our operational plan um, for Bedfordshire and Luton, and uh, it's yet to be included for Milton Keynes. I understand that you've got an emerging partnership board um, and partnership arrangements um, with a programme lead, um, David Stout, who I've had conversations with. I did also uh, plan a meeting with Mick Hancock, but unfortunately, he's unwell with COVID, so that hasn't taken place. Just to raise the importance and make sure that this is a is a, is a partnership um, priority within the new Milton Keynes partnership arrangements. I think it has to be. Uh, we we are doing lots of work elsewhere. We've got things we can repurpose in Bedfordshire and Luton, and we haven't got anything to to work with apart from the existing services, which, as Peter has articulated, um, has reduced funding. So uh, I, I hope we have uh, made a plea to the national team, to Professor Bewe, um, for um, additional government funding. But to date, there has not been any additional funding um, come down through uh, from government for this purpose to the CCG shortly to become Integrated Care Board. OK, thanks, Diane. I can see Peter's hands up, so please do come in, Peter. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I think it's very difficult. The CCG, um, ICS, ICB is placed in a very difficult position with a national priority and um, limited or no funding. Um, it isn't a priority for the Milton Keynes Health and Care Partnership. Um, and I think that needs to be addressed. The uplift for this year is 2.1%. Inflation's running at 9%. Our community services are not funded. And BLMK have a £40 million deficit. Um, and I think if you're all highly intelligent people, it doesn't take me to tell you that that situation is unsustainable. And I think pressure needs to be brought to bear that if we are going to have policy rhetoric that says that palliative care is a priority and that we must fund core and specialist services, then there must be investment to follow that policy imperative. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, that's noted, certainly. Uh, Councillor Long. Thank you, Chair. And first of all, can I say that I find this subject absolutely fascinating and it's a really important service. But I want to um, build on what was just said in the last contribution. It strikes me that as we move towards an integrated an integrated care system, if we're saying to it, as it says in the paper, that it's got to make financial provision for a service like this. I think there are just so many challenges, and, and I think this is going to be an issue that comes back to us again and again. There's going to be so many challenges about how that money is spent across the whole BLMK uh, integrated care service. You know, so for example, I might be persuaded that more money should go into home-based care and support as an alternative to hospital-based care and support, and therefore perhaps as an alternative to, to uh, palliative care through, through say, willing or so. It strikes me as we've got a really difficult challenge ahead about how the integrated care system is going to actually, in a time of financial restraint, is going to find enough money to, to fund all the services it needs to fund. And I guess we're going to have to have a strategic debate about what the priorities are, and I guess our partners in the integrated care system are going to have the same same take on it. Um, so I mean, I think it's a really important debate about how forward planning on finances fits into the integrated care system. And I think this service, which is really valuable, could be, as was I think suggested, marginalised by other pressures on, on on budgets. It's a big challenge. Thank you. Thank you. I know that's a, a comment, and uh, you know, building on what Peter and uh, <laughs> myself, or is it Diane or Peter? You're asking. Are you asking me? You're no, asking. I'm not asking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
To be honest with you, I think um, there are a few things I would like to recommend, but what I'd like to do is open it up to the floor. I know some people have asked questions, some people have made comments, um, but are there any recommendations based on some of the key things we've already spoken about? Um, just to recap, uh, obviously funding is one of the key areas we've just touched on now. Um, we've discussed um, engagement, co-production, We've talked about timeline development. We've talked about the model. Um, we've also talked about how, and I think this was Diane's direct um, uh, request, how ourselves as councillors can get involved as community leaders to work with Diane and you know whoever else to see how we can introduce them into the community with regards to engagement. So I'm going to throw it open. Any recommendation, any comments... Uh, around that before I sort of give my thoughts and, and we round round this up. Councillor Bradburn. Sorry, thank you. I think the funding is top priority because if we don't have the funding then everything else is going to fall down like a pack of cards really or dominoes. So it's the funding that, that's the crucial bit, isn't it? And where where is it going to come from? Thank you, Councillor Bradburn. Um, I mean, from my point of view, I think what I'm grappling with at the moment, given what Councillor Long has just said about the development of the ICS, because from what we heard last year, that you know there is still quite a lot of development in terms of how things will look. Um, I know that there is it the July or, or some other time that 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 whole sort of um, process will kick off in terms of having a formal. Um, ICS on the ground across the country but my concern is at this point in time that things are still developing how do we put our cards on the table with regards to this service uh, I mean obviously I know that there is a board that is forming and you know there, there must be priorities that have already been adopted whether a recommendation might be looking at presenting something to the board with regards to this topic uh, and requesting that we look at a way forward via that avenue. Uh, Diane, did you have some comments on that? That would be extremely helpful because obviously the CCG ceases to exist in um, well, a few days' time and we are reliant on the emerging integrated care systems um, working with us. We have got palliative and end-of-life care as a priority in the Bedfordshire Care Alliance. But as Peter said, it's not appeared in the Milton Keynes. Now that may be because like you've said, councillor, that um, plans are emerging. But I do really, really reach out for your support to put this on as a top priority. And that if there is any opportunity to help us mobilise, what I would like to say in relation to funding is Although we have expressed that there is a lack of funding, we, we do have the ability to move through a four-year investment plan. We also want to maximise the efficient use of what we've already got. And I think when Dr Janewell talked about Airedale, we have to consider that there well may be resources that are wasted um, because we don't have an integrated care hub in place, as well as the very detrimental fact of what Jane said in relation to where people's choice of death is, and it's not being carried out. So if Airedale's 20% and 80% is in their preferred days or, or in the community at home, that is not um, a, a statistic that we could present um, to your residents and constituents, unfortunately. If you think about, therefore, the maximising the efficient use for your constituents for other reasons around the use of ambulance, the use of ED, the use of general practitioner team time, um, then it all starts to make absolute sense to make this a key priority. It's not huge amounts of money because we're building on existing services. We just need to bring what we've got working together as an integrated hub model and then happy to monitor the benefits um, of, of, of that approach. 
Okay, thank you, Diane. Thanks for that input. So from my point of view, I think there are two recommendations I'd like to put forward this evening regarding um, this topic. The first being the issue of funding, which I think there is a consensus around the room that that is um, the highest priority coming out from this presentation. So given the fact that from my memory, um, we actually do have um, a shadow board in place at the moment, <coughs> Uh, which has agreed through consultation or whatever priorities for the year or for the next two, three years, I'm, I'm not quite sure the timeline, whether we could recommend as a committee uh, the uh, board to consider this particular agenda in terms of end-of-life care and how best to do that. I mean, that would be my first uh, suggestion to the committee. Any thoughts, any comments on that? Are we in agreement? Is, yes, it, is it more? Long. Oh, sorry. Councillor I... Long. I mean, clearly, that this is an important service that ought to be funded. But I can think of a whole series of other services that ought to be funded. Mm. Um, I know that 55% of the council's uh, budget goes on adults and children's social services. So the question I would ask immediately is, in order to fund this, what other areas might be put under pressure? So it strikes me that what we need is officers to have a look at perhaps what, where this fits into the kind of priorities that the council should adopt. I mean, I think it's extremely worthwhile, but whether there are other things that we should be spending money on, I don't know. But certainly we should look at it, but I think we would be... We would be um, a bit foolish almost to commit to something that we might find officers say, well, actually, we can't afford to fund that. Mm. Um, we're, we're, fund we're putting much greater emphasis on home care services, yeah. for example. So I, think, I just think we need to be slightly careful, Chair. Um, I mean, I think, for example, to give you another one, I think the funding of public health is really, really important. Mm -hmm. How that fits into the, the new model, the integrated care system, I, I don't know. I think home care services are exceptionally important. I think some other preventative stuff are really, really important. But where this excellent service and this important service fits into that whole picture, I don't know. I don't know from tonight. You know, there's, there's no paper on that. So I just think we need to be slightly careful. Is there anything I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Long. Uh, I do agree with some of the things you said. Um, Ross? Chair, I'm just wondering, and the question probably back to Diane, the comment about funding, is that more funding from to come from national government rather than within...? Um, actually, the, um, the funding, the, just to, to uh, be quite pertinent, the national guidance requires joint funding from local authorities and health. Um, and that is a requirement that we've got to do, whether whether we've got the money or not. We have got to look at this as to how we intend to move from the position we're in. And um, it is, again, a joint policy that was published last November, a joint commissioning investment framework um, against the national policy guidance. And that piece of work is called the commissioning investment framework, which I'm happy to share. So there's, there's that guidance, which... It's not a would like to do. Unfortunately, um, financially, it's we have got to do. Um, so we are hoping that new money will come from central government because they've made it a priority. But to date, we have no indication of what that is. Um, way back when I was working in a council, I remembered that the, there was some uh, money around the Better Care Fund and palliative and end-of-life care um, was a strategic priority there. And I wondered whether that is a pot that we could look to uh, find some, if there's any residual. Um, uh, so locally, um, are there any section money that we could tap into and influence your prioritisation for the spend of the BCF funding um, with an um, we're quite realistic, I think, both health and social care, that we won't crack this um, overnight. But I think if we can make some incremental moves, 
especially towards the coordination of existing services, because that means that it's increasing patient and public experience and it's increasing the efficient use of both our health and social care services. Because all of the services that your uh, colleague councillor mentioned are key to the individual also going through palliative and end of life care. So it's around how can we tap into those as well? How can we maximise the existing commission services that our social care teams and local authorities already um, spend money on and make sure that it's coordinated around the individual. And the, the key thing is getting that integrated hub operational so we can maximise the use of our existing money. I know Peter's waiting to come in. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks, Diane. Peter, you come in and then I'll uh, say what's on my mind. I, I, I totally understand that there will always be competing priorities, but I think that um, there, it, there's a need for clarification around particularly, you know, the excellent work of the hospitalist in terms of, of the hospital in terms of specialist palliative care, but also the fact that at the hospice we not only provide an inpatient unit, but we support over 300 people in the community with our specialist will and at home team. And we support um, a, a, another considerable number of people within our therapeutic and wellbeing services. And that 18% of funding from statutory services means that we have to raise more than £5 million from the community of Milton Keynes. And every single year, that percentage to be raised from the community increases. So we are a net contributor to the system and we are sitting on a £1.5 million budgeted deficit and we cannot sustain it. So time is running out, I'm afraid. And I believe, and I hope you do too, that we provide a very vital service to people at the most difficult time of their lives and their families and loved ones. And some of the services that we're talking about now are absolutely imperative to ensure that we can deliver that good service and that excellent standard of care to people going forward. And if we don't invest in it, then we'll have to think about what we're going to stop. I think the dog agrees with you as well, Peter, wherever it's coming from. <laughs> Thank so you. sorry, it's mine. I really <laughs> apologise. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so I'd like to rephrase what I was suggesting, and I know that Councillor Long has, has given his comments, which I do agree with. Um, and I'm thinking <clears throat> from my understanding of the ICS, and given the fact that, you know, what you mentioned, Diane, about... Um, the fact that the CCG is winding up in a matter of days, moving into the new ICB, ICS, um, it might prove a little bit foolhardy to, to jump in at this stage to recommend anything to that board. But what I think we actually could do was seek the advice of some of our senior officers. And I'm, I'm noting that the Director of Social Services isn't around She's today. Leave. She's on leave, OK. Um, and I'm thinking if we can recommend some sort of uh, review or discussion on this topic by uh, the Director of Social Services, possibly health, because I know that there is a joint aspect to this, to look at the best possible way to introduce this agenda to the priority setting um, process, which I know will come as the ICS develops itself. So that way, um, we've got a considered um, approach from professionals who understand what's going on, MK-wise. Uh, we can use their seniority, their leverage, to then talk to ICS partners in the system about how we get this in the mix of priority setting. Does that sound acceptable to committee members? I can see Sorry, nods. Can I, can I just come in on what uh, Diane said about the Better Care Fund and, yes. and the work that they, we're doing already with the hospital um, of getting our patients out um, 
In actual fact, I think the programme starts as soon as they're admitted into hospital. There's a programme in place that they're, they're looking at to discharge them. So, um, you know, when you say looking at a pot of money, um, I think that's been working quite well. And um, my colleague across the room, Alice, has been um, involved in that as chair of um, this committee over the years with Victoria Collins. And I think we were very pleased about the way that work was going. So I'm not sure how much money might be left in that pot, but uh, just just to say that the, that pot has been doing very well for us with, with different areas of discharge from hospital. Thanks, Councillor Bradburn. And it really would have been helpful to have this next item um, on the BCF, which was cancelled um, due to Mick being off, uh, off with COVID. So... I'm thinking probably by the end of that, um, we'll have a better idea as a committee where things are in terms of the BCF. But actually, before then, I, I think that there is a way in terms of referring this back um, to Vicky and her staff and properly linking in health um, to look at how we can uh, position this agenda in terms of priority setting that will obviously happen once the ICS comes into play. So... I would like that as a recommendation. I think I've got the nods of my fellow councillors around the table. Uh, Councillor Long. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to support what you were saying and what was said about the Better Care Fund. And the Better Care Fund is 24.8 million. Um, set out on page 22 of the, the next report we're not considering. Um, but also on page 25 of the next report we're not considering, it highlights that one of the prior, five priorities is avoidable, avoidable admissions. So I think going back to officers and asking them to look at better care fund, look at the whole funding uh, regime, I think I think makes sense, and I think there's a better way forward than, than making some kind of commitment that we might find ourselves not not being able to deliver on at the end of the day. So I think what you're saying now is spot on. Thank you. Um, okay. So the the other recommendation I certainly would like to put forward to the floor is around the whole co-production. Uh, engagement, consultation, uh, discussion we had earlier, and I know that Maxine, uh, you know, contributed to that or kicked that off in terms of conversation was around looking at ways in which uh, we can work, we being the councillor network here as community leaders can work with you directly to get uh, the story and this agenda into the community. Um, I'm thinking that there may be uh, an opportunity to sit down and discuss one-on-one -on -one with yourself, Diane, and maybe whoever else you, you might choose um, with myself, and I'll probably involve the vice chairs in that. And if we have to take it to committee, then we will do that. Uh, but I'll leave it to Ros to, to organise, to, to meet up with you offline, please. That would be extremely helpful. And also the comment on the avoidable admission, um, you know, being sort of the real priority around the funding is exactly what it's about. It's, you know, avoiding any any trips to hospital where they're not required. Um, but thank you, councillor. Thank you for that. And I'm more than happy to meet with you at your convenience to discuss that. OK, councillor Long. Thanks, Diane. Thank you, Chair. Can I, can I again support you on the point about co-production and, and looking at co-production and how important it is? I know in my day job I've been looking at co-production around the country, and particularly looking at Hammersmith and Fulham and its work around disabled people and looking at Swansea and, again, its work around disabled people. I think if we can actually support the development of co-production, not just in this area, but actually across a whole series of council services, I think that would be a really good way forward. And I think it leads to better services. Services are much more customer focused. So again, I support your recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Long. Any other comments around the table? I can see uh, looks from this end. Any comments at all? No? All right. OK, well, I think we've come to the end of that item. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Dr Jane. Thank you very much. Take care. Keep safe. Bye-bye.
Okay, so uh, the next agenda item, as we've all heard, uh, has been postponed, and I'm hoping that Ros, at some stage in the future, because actually it is very important, given the range of other things that we need to consider, um, that Mick does come back uh, and is given proper time to talk to us about this. Uh, on to the next item, which is uh, looking at the work programme. So, at the end of the last year, so does anybody have comments on BCF? No. So, looking at the last year, um, while I was still chair, we did actually have a range of topics uh, that we added on to the end of the work programme that we might consider coming this year. Um, I will open up the floor to any other items people from the committee want to bring forward for us to consider as part of the work programme. Uh, having said that, I know that Ros is arranging a planning session between the vice chairs and myself to have a look at that work programme going forwards. If you don't have anything at this very point in time, please feel free to email myself or Ros with some thoughts and we can add that into the planning session going forwards. Councillor Long. Thank you, Chair. I'm just looking at my, 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 my notes on this. I mean, I think there's a whole debate around um, how we promote independent living. And I know I've touched upon that already tonight. And I think that's linked in with that whole debate about specialist and supported housing. Um, and I know that's particularly around disabled people, but it's not just disabled people. And then I think there's a debate linked to that about accessible housing. Um, and I was going to talk tonight about accessible housing under the item we're not talking about. Because, because this whole issue of uh, disability facilities grant is a huge, huge issue. So I would suggest, firstly, we ought to look at independent living, and, and, and that also ties in incredibly tightly with the digital debate that both the NHS and social care are having. Um, and then if I could be really uh, controversial, I suppose, one of the things that's impressed me most in the country is the fact that Hammersmith and Fulham doesn't charge for social, doesn't charge for home care services. Um, it's now not charged for home care services for, I think, six years. And what they found is that it's not costing them anything to, you know, it, it's a break-even thing. It's not costing the council a lot of money um, to have uh, free home care services. So I think it'd be really interesting to look at free home care services and see whether that's an option that Milton Keynes, Milton Keynes could look at doesn't detract from the the range of providers debate so it doesn't detract from the commissioning debate but it certainly is a much more effective uh, approach to home care if you don't charge for it because you're not involved in all that stuff all that invoicing all that debt chasing and you take out that whole financial ass assessment stage and then you can use those resources for other more pressing social care needs. So I think it might be quite interesting to have a look at that at some point and see how Hammersmith and Fulham uh, have done that. Um, I suppose you ought to declare that I used to work for Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, not in social care, in housing. Um, and I've been doing some work with Hammersmith and Fulham recently with uh, my kind of disability hat on. Uh, but I think it would be really interesting to pick that issue up um, and then to pick up the other issue of independent living. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Long. I certainly will, um, I've made a note of it, I know Ros has as well, and we will be discussing it at our, our planning session. I know that we did have a packed agenda last year, and even on top of that, we still had a few more items that we needed to consider, but we'll, we'll have a chat and uh, come back uh, at the next meeting in September. Uh, any other areas anyone would like to raise? Okay, thank you. So that moves us on to any AOBs before we finish off. Nothing. Okay. Sorry, Chair. Can I just um, just mention that would would it be nice just to say what wonderful work that the um, Will and Hospice is mm. doing, and yeah. just to just thank you to them. Yes, I think that would yeah. be very good. Thank you. That, that's a great idea. Thank you, Councillor Bradburn. Okay, well, we finished the meeting rather early, but we all know why that is. Uh, good to see everyone. See you in September. Thank you.